Hey, today we are reaching the end of our series on Fruit of the Spirit. It feels like we've been at this for almost six months, but it's been a little over two. But it, it takes a while to really go through the Fruit of the Spirit. And today is the challenging one, the one that everybody seems to be lacking sometimes. Stand with me as we read Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 through 26. I'll be reading now the NIV Bible. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. Father, we thank you for the word. We ask that you bless it, Lord God, that it may manifest newly in our old souls. Lord God, can you give us a fresh touch this morning to help us walk closer to you? In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Today we're going to talk about self-control. How many of you have self-control? Show of hands. Okay. Thank you for the honesty. We may not need an altar call today now. But it's, it's self-control is one of those things we love when we see that somebody else has. We wish we had it. I had a gentleman one time said, I could resist anything but temptation. And that's a problem of self-control. And we love it probably because... There's so many of us who lack it. Oh, we respect those who, who demonstrate it. You know, whenever dessert comes and everybody's eating it, but you're diabetic and you know you shouldn't have it and you're probably still going to eat it, but you have that one friend like, no, no, I'm not. And you respect them like they have some superpower against sugar that, you know, we don't give in to, but we do, don't we? Listen, I, I've come to realize after going through this series and remember what I said last week? What if the fruit of the Spirit hung like an apple tree? Some of the lower fruit were the things that we enjoy, like love and peace and joy. And as the fruit of the Spirit goes, it gets a little bit higher. It takes a little more to obtain, right? Like, you know, self-control. It's kind of at the top of the tree. And when you really think about it, it's self-control that's needed to be able to uh, maintain and to groom and to uh, bear more fruit of the rest of the fruit, if you think about it. See, truthfully, without self-control, you don't have patience. Without self-control, you're probably not that good. And without self-control, you're usually not faithful. See, self-control is these things that we must have, and if we don't have self-control to help us maintain the rest of the fruit, then we usually don't have joy. We usually struggle to love. Without self-control, we, we struggle to even have patience. I mean, think about it. Have you ever seen somebody who has no patience at all but has great self-control? It just doesn't work that way, right? So when you really think about it, I wonder if Paul interest, uh, intricately placed the fruits of the Spirit knowing that it is with the maturity of holy people. That sooner or later, as we are walking along with God, that, that final branch, the very top of the tree, is the pinnacle of the fruit of the Spirit. Because honestly, self-control first would be kind of hard, wouldn't it? Oh, you got to have self-control before you can have love. Oh, you got to have self-control before you can be patient. No, you've got to learn these things first. And when you get self-control, then you're able to not only maintain it, but you're allowed to bless the rest of the fruit. Because when you have this ability to have self-control, people see you as God's holy children. You're able to withstand what the devil throws at you. And without self-control, you're just a piece of grass blowing in the wind back and forth. Amen? Listen, there's a story of a young boy who was selling a lawnmower. And this gentleman walked up who happened to be a preacher and he said, son, does that lawnmower run? He goes, it sure does, sir. Go ahead and pull it. The preacher started pulling and pulling and pulling. And finally he said, son, this thing doesn't work. That boy says, sure it does. You just got to cuss it. 
preacher says, listen, I've been a pastor now for 18 years. I don't curse anymore. He goes, keep pulling. It'll come back. <laughs> Without self-control, sometimes our old habits come back, don't they? When you really think about it. You know, I, th- we always talk about just underneath the skin, there's this, that old self. And if we don't have self-control, we get ourselves into all kinds of trouble. Without self-control, we find ourselves doing what the old self used to do. See, self-control helps us maintain our witness, helps our love be first, not our anger. Self-control allows our joy, not our frustration, not our depression or anything else that manifests on the outside. See, it's self-control that allows you and I to be children of God that, that bears much fruit, right? And that's what Jesus says. It's his will that you bear much fruit. But, you know, Jesus says a bad tree can't bear good fruit. And a good tree can't bear bad fruit. And so when you really think about all this fruit that Jesus is talking about and Paul's talking about, we're really talking about self-control. Because if you really are a good tree and you're doing good things, you will bear good fruit. But if you have no self-control, you'll bear bad fruit. I mean, think about it. How many times in lives have we met people who live like victims, right? We've all been victims, every one of us, but we choose not to live like a victim or stay in a moment to victimize us. I mean, that's why we need a redeemer. That's why Jesus called a restore to move us past those points. And it takes self-control to realize, hey, that season of life, that moment of pain is over and I can be here, but you got to have self-control to pull yourself out of that. How many times have we heard someone say, we don't understand what I've been through, right? Maybe you've used that yourself. Well, I don't know about you. I don't know how many of us have been nailed to a cross. Well, you didn't have my upbringing. Well, you didn't have my upbringing. You didn't know what was going on behind the scenes. You're right, I don't, but he does. So many times will you pour excuses to live poorly as an excuse to have no self-control, to continue to act out in carnal ways that go against what the word of God says. God's not asking for perfection. No, he's the perfecter and author of our faith. What he's asking for is obedience, amen? I, one of my favorite disciples, not one of the favorite disciple of mine, you've heard me say many times is Peter, Simon Peter. Simon Peter was a jerk, right? He loved Jesus, but I don't think he was that sanctified for the most part. I, sometimes I resemble that guy, right? I'm not perfect, but I love Jesus. I'll make mistakes. And you can just see Peter was the guy who probably was starting fights all the time in the group, right? I mean, they got uh, Simon Peter, he's a zealot. He hates politicians, he hates religious people, he hates tax collectors, he kind of hates everybody but himself. And this is who Jesus chose. He must be God, because only God can control a man like that. And who was one of the next disciples? Matthew, a tax collector. You know how many times Jesus probably had to sleep between Peter and Matthew to keep Peter from killing Matthew? I don't think Peter had much self-control, do you? Matter of fact, we find that out. On the night Jesus was arrested, Peter had a knife. And he pulled it out and cut a guy's ear off. He's skilled with that knife, but think about it. Peter had the knife the whole time he was with Jesus. He had no self-control. He's got to keep that knife. You ever see anybody got billy clubs in their car for just in case? I'm 51, I've never had just in case, right? Well, I carry a knife just in case. In case of what? Right? My dad, he carried a pocket knife to clean the the dirt out of his fingernails. Up here, he's carrying a knife for just in case. And just in case happened, he pulled it out and he cut the ear off of this guy. He's got no self-control. And Jesus tells him, live by the sword, die by the sword. What are you carrying for just in case? That you got no self-control and it really comes down to no trust in God. But it's interesting. After Pentecost, Peter, the Holy Spirit cut 
comes and touches his tongue and his lips and he's baptized by the Holy Spirit and this changes who Peter is because remember, it's the fruit of the Spirit. Peter is now touched by the Spirit of God. And all of a sudden, this rugged religious jerk who loves violence and carrying a knife humbles himself. And later on, we find Peter, he's, he's kind of in the church. Nero's out to kill him. He's, he's killing Christians at a rapid pace. You figure Peter would write something really mean, right? On how to stand up for yourself and, and how to take your knives out and cut an ear off and all these other things. But listen what Peter says after the Holy Spirit touches him and Peter gets a little self-control. He writes this in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 through 11. And again, remember... This is Peter, the zealot. He says, humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be alert and sober-minded. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, self-control, resist him. Stand firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same covenant of suffering. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you, make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. Something's happened to Peter. All of a sudden, he is bearing the fruit of the Spirit. He's got some self-control. The old Peter would just immediately go out on this hunt for Nero and take him down himself, but he's talking about praying. And not just for yourself, but all the believers throughout the world. And he has enough self-control. He's like, listen, the devil's like a lion. He's prowling. Don't give in. Have some self-control. Don't give in to that temptation to want to lash out. Stand firm in the faith. God will restore you. Just stay in prayer. And, and God will do all the work. You don't have to. Oh, this just sounds like a totally different Peter, doesn't it? But the same happens for you and I. We don't have to live the way we used to. No matter how extreme the old was, God can do something absolutely amazing on this side of the cross, can he? We've got to learn to get to the point where we don't give in. Listen, Peter talks about how the devil, he prowls around like a roaring lion. I don't know about you, but one of my favorite things to do with Donna is we watch Animal Planet together, right? The other day, we watched a dog have some tumors removed. I thought it was cool. She thought it was gross. But we've also watched lions and tigers. You ever watch how these big cats stalk their prey? It's very interesting. They will look for a weak animal or an injured animal, or someone not paying attention, and they'll prey upon that. Peter's warning the same thing. The devil is prowling around you. He's looking for something weak in you, and he's gonna capitalize on it. He's gonna attack you where you're weak. And if you have no self-control, you've got no defense around the walls of your life, your spirit, amen? And it doesn't matter if it's the devil finds out that your weak spot is anger, a bad mouth, a bad attitude, selfishness, sexuality, uh, anger, and it goes on and on and on. Then the devil is prowling around like an angry lion. He's coming to steal, kill, and destroy your fruit, your ability to be a good witness. That's what he does. And Peter's reminded us, you need to stay focused on Jesus. He is the author and perfecter. Stand firm. He'll get you through. Too often we fall into sin because of no self-control when you think about it. Matter of fact, years ago I was driving after I first got in ministry and I was listening to this radio preacher and he said, the minute you think about a sin of temptation, you're probably going to give in to it. You ever notice that? I want you to think about that. The minute you think about a sin, a temptational sin, you know that one you struggle with? It's usually too late. You're going to give in. And when I thought about that, and it's never left me after all these years, I think about no self-control. I can resist anything but temptation. Amen. 
What is your temptation? The devil is prowling. He's going to get you. He doesn't care about you, but he wants to harm you. Your family. Families are under attack more than I've ever seen. Maybe it's because I'm getting a little older and family means a whole lot more to me. But families are under attack. And the devil's looking for a way to get into your family because if he can get you and your loved one, he'll get your children and your grandchildren and all those around you, amen? Don't let the devil get your, your family. There was a story, I don't know, a couple of months ago, there was a farmer. It was his 40th anniversary and he was driving around the area of the Anaheim Hills and he decided, he had seen this sign, he wanted to do something special for his wife and he seen the sign, said airplane rides over the Anaheim Mountains. $50 a person. Oh, the farmer, he pulled in, he inquired about it. And being a farmer, I grew up on a farm, I understand this. He started negotiating and he says, I'll pay you $50 for both of us, but not for one each. Finally, the pilot gave in, said, okay, here's what I'll do. It's, it's $50 for you both. But if I hear one word, it's going up to $100 a person. Farmer's like, okay. That pilot took off and he started flying. He did aerobatics that were out of this world and, and crazy and up and down the mountains and upside down and backwards and loops. Farmer didn't say a peep. Finally, a pilot landed. He goes, man, you have got great self-control. A couple of those things that I was doing even had me scared. I can't believe you stayed that quiet. The old farmer goes, well, I almost said something when she fell out the door, but I realized I need to keep my mouth shut. That's self-control right there. You're worth more than $100 to me. I'll say something, I promise. But when we think about it, self-control, the Greek word is inkerta. It talks about strength. How many of y'all have strength? That when the devil comes, you can fight him. That your spirit is fortified. And Solomon writes this in Proverbs 25, 28. He says, like a city whose walls are broken through is a person who lacks self-control. Peter's talking about this. We need self-control. The devil's gonna look for areas in the walls around your spirit. And he's gonna come in, and he's gonna get it. You know, when we really look at the Hebrew cities and Roman Empire and all those, during that time, they built walls around to protect. And they would have to go around and look for holes. Nehemiah was always doing this because the enemy came in through those holes in your wall. I wanna let you know the enemy's coming. He'll never quit on you. I want you to know that. I always say, joking, I'm gonna come into heaven with skinned up knees and elbows and there's gonna be flames on my heels. Not just me, but you too. The devil will not ever give up on you. You'll have flames on your heels too. And he's looking for holes in the wall that surround your spirit. I want you to close your eyes for just a minute. Take a walk around the walls of your spirit. Do you see any holes there? Maybe the hole is pride. Maybe the hole is arrogance. Maybe it's money. Maybe it's sexuality. Maybe it is insecurity. What are some of the holes in the wall of your life that the devil has been coming after in you? Fortify those holes. Learn to resist anything that's not of God. You and I don't need to give in to those things, but you have to fortify the walls in your life because the evil one, he's prowling around you. He's looking for a way into your life, into your family, into your insecurities, your fears. Maybe he's gonna puff you up, make you proud and arrogant instead of learning to be humble and meek as we talked about last week. Where are the weak areas of your life the devil is looking to try to get in? Will you just keep messing up? I'll tell you this morning, the best way to fix those holes is with the prayer, the power of prayer in your life. That's what Peter says. You're not the only one going through. Peter says, believers all around the world are suffering the same trials. That's because the devil is the same. He has no new tricks. We are broken. We need to learn some self-control. You're never gonna love the unlovable if you don't have self-control.
You're never going to forgive the unforgivable without self-control. You'll never put others first without self-control. You and I need self-control to maintain the rest of the fruit of the Spirit. It's self-control that'll get you there. Paul even says, not envying or provoking each other. Our faith is not about arrogance. Uh, We've been Nazarenes this long and Christians this long and I go to that church. We need to have some self-control and say, I am just a believer in Jesus Christ. I'm not any better than anyone. So many times we love to brag about what churches we go to and what Bible studies we've been part of or who we've studied under and what we've done and that's puffing up. We need to stop that. We need to start showing people how much we love, not how much we know. Because if you can't show love, you're only the resounding gong of a symbol that does not sound like love. And when we begin to fix the holes in the walls of our spirit, we can learn to help others. And then we produce fruit that lasts. Fruit that produces other fruit in other people. And the world will begin to change. But change starts with us. Jesus has done all the work. God has provided all the options for you and I. Now we need a little self-control, not to give in when the devil comes, but stay in prayer, to stay in faith. Don't let him steal your joy. Don't let him steal your love. Don't let him steal your peace or your patience or your kindness or your goodness, and especially not your love. He's coming for those things, and he's looking for the holes in your walls surrounding your spirit this morning. Hey everybody, thank you so much for joining us at Long Beach Nazarene. If you enjoyed the message today, please share it with a friend. We know that the gospel has to get out there to everybody. Our call is to spread the good news of Jesus Christ. If you want to partner with us, check us out at lbfnaz.org and there's a give online button in there as well. Don't forget to click subscribe. We'll see you later. God bless.